Let's sing about it. Amen. Oh, don't you look forward to heaven? Sing it out this morning. There is coming a day when the heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. Oh, what a day, glorious day that will be. Oh, what a day that will be. Oh, when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. Oh, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. Oh, what a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there, and forever I will be, oh, with the one who died for me, oh, what a day. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, oh, what a day, glorious day that will be. the Lord. Are you glad to be here? Yeah. I am glad to be here too. The Vasics are with us. I've been looking forward to this Sunday and uh, I know it's going to be a great Sunday and it's Family of God Fellowship Sunday and so we're going to have a great time even after this service but let's pray right now. Let's ask God to meet with us. Father, we just love you and thank you for the privilege of being in your house to be able to open up your word, to be able to sing praises unto thee. Thank you for this group that has come out this morning, good, good attendance this morning. And Father, we pray for those that are still out sick, thankful for some that have been sick that are back with us right now, praising you for that, Lord. But I think of our brother Grady, who's in the hospital, he's still not doing good. We pray that God, you would be with him and, and strengthen him, and I'm sure there's some others that are, that maybe I'm missing here this morning, but... I want you to be with Brother Brian. I want you to have your hand on him. He's doing better, but Lord, he's got a, he's got a ways to go. You're bringing him along, and thank you for it, Lord, and continue to bless there. We just love you, Lord. You're the great, great, great God of heaven. You're our Savior, Amen. and we love you. You're our Father, Amen. and we just are so thankful to be in your house in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 477, the solid rock. Let's sing it out. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest prayer, but holy lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace, in every heart and 
And if you'll take a moment and fill out a guest card that's inside of there, Brother Tom Strophus right here will give you a $100 bill. <laughs> All right? And uh, so you just see him afterwards. Actually, you don't want to see him. You want to see his wife. All right? <laughs> Seriously, we're so glad you're here with us this morning. And uh, I, I hope that you'll come back and visit us again and again and again. So ushers, make your way to the back if you would. And uh, if you need a bulletin also, they have bulletins for you. And they'll be happy to accommodate you with that. Announcements are pretty simple. It's Family of God Fellowship Sunday. And so right after here, we go next door. We do what Baptists do good. And that is we eat. The second best thing we do is fellowship. Amen? And boy, we need that. Every church needs to fellowship as much as it possibly can. Especially in this day and time. And uh, we, don't need, we don't need less fellowship and less church. We need to have more of both. Amen? Amen? So I'm so glad you're here today. I, Betty and I heard such great things. We saw some pictures of uh, the marriage retreat. I want to say thank you. First of all, my wife worked really, really hard on decorations. And so I, I praise Betty for just her skill in that way. If it was up to me... Good night. I think there'd be tumbleweeds or something, you know. Amen. But, but also, also, I want to, I want you to, I, I want you to give uh, also a big thanks to Sister Meg. Hey. Uh, and Sister Lori, somewhere. Yes. Where's Lori? She's right there. You, I heard you did up the bulletin or mm -hmm. the program. And did something. You know, I'll tell you something. It's just, you never go wrong when you're investing in your marriage. Yeah. Yeah. You, ne you never go wrong when you're investing in your family. <coughs> and boy, I'll tell you what, we were so blessed to be able to have Pastor Vasek and his wife Amy back with us. Amen. I mean, it's not like they're not busy people, right. okay? <laughs> And, and so, honestly, for them to be able to set aside this time and come and be with us and stay over and preach, you know, it's tough on a pastor when he's not in his own pulpit and preaching to his people. There isn't any place I know, there isn't any place in America you'd rather preach than your own pulpit. Yeah. And that's the way I feel about Elmwood, too. And so, for them to stay over, I just praise God for that. Amen. And thank you for all of you that went to the marriage retreat. I hope you had a great time. And uh, the pictures tell a little bit of the story, but Betty and I will be there next year. We'll be there next year. Lord willing, we'll be able to, to, to do it. If, if we don't do it next year, it's because we're all in heaven. Amen. And then we don't need to do that. The rapture finally came. So we're looking forward to that, aren't we? Praise God. So anyway... I want you to be praying for a couple of things, if you would. State of the church is this Thursday, so members, be faithfully in your place. Thank you for all that, that, that uh, sent in nominations for deacons for this coming year, and uh, I'll announce that this coming Thursday. So 7 o'clock, state of the church. I'll be preaching that night, and then following the, the, the preaching, We'll, we'll have our state of the church meeting, which is not very long, 
but it'll be a blessing, and I want you to be their members, so please uh, take care of that. And then February 12th, that's a Saturday, Young at Heart are having an activity here at the church, and there was a sign-up, and I don't know if you still have to sign up. Still have to sign up? Sign up still there from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock, and come on out. Again, you need the fellowship. Iron sharpeneth iron. That's what the Bible says, and we need to we need to get sharp, amen? And God uses people to make sure that that happens. And then coming up is our 8th annual Elmwood Baptist Academy Regionals Barbecue Dinner and Concert. And you need to sign up for that. That's in the back as well, additional information. Two, two times, Friday, February 18th, and Saturday, February 19th. I'll tell you something, we've been to most of these over the years. Uh, in fact, I think all of them. And it has been absolutely phenomenal. These kids work really, really hard to be able to serve the Lord with the skills and abilities and talents that God has given to them. And I like encouraging them. And I love this church because you love encouraging our young people. So I want you to get signed up for that. The, 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 the price of all of that you can see in the flyer or you can get that information on the back table. And that'll be a, a, a great, great blessing to the academy. And then, of course, deacon, our, our monthly deacon meeting on the 20th and Lace Fellowship on the 26th, ladies, for you. And we want to uh, just encourage you. Let's be involved in everything that's going on in the month of February. Now, some have asked, Pastor, when's your surgery? Well, I'm going in for this knee surgery, Lord willing, on Friday morning at 530 so I appreciate your prayers on that. I have a COVID test. I don't know why. I'm healthy as a horse, and I'm just about as big. <laughs> I went in for my pre-op, and the, and the doctor said, I can't believe, I mean, all the blood work came back perfect. He said, your, your blood pressure is like, you know, I, I can't remember what it was. He said, you got the blood pressure of an 18-year-old. I said, there's two 18-year-olds in here trying to get out. <laughs> um, anyway, everything's cool. i got to have the, the COVID test on Tuesday, so pray for me about that. I, uh, I, I want to I pass, okay? I want to <laughs> pass. And uh, appreciate your prayers on all of that. It'll be, it'll be just a, a tremendous, tremendous uh, 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 help to me once this is done. Thank you for all of you who have had this done, and you've come to me to tell me exactly how much pain I'm going to experience. <laughs> I can't tell you what a comfort that you have been to me. <laughs> and so I think, I think even before I even go to sleep for the surgery, I'm going to be crying already. <laughs> and so anyway, I appreciate your prayers. I want you to pray now for the choir as they come sing a, a wonderful medley called The Old Rugged Cross.
Stand together, will you? Number 228 in your songbook. He hideth my soul. Oh, praise our wonderful Savior for his wonderful grace. Amen. Sing it together. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A this morning. Good to have you out. God bless you.
Let's sing that chorus out together. Sing it out. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. God bless you. You may be seated. At the dawn of eternity, when the mist of time is gone, when the choir of heaven gathers to begin redemption's song, I will bow before my Savior in a body new and whole. Then I'll rise to sing His praises while eternal ages roll, I stand redeemed by the blood of Jesus. My death is paid. My death is gone. The chains that bound me no longer hold me because of Calvary I stand redeemed as I gaze upon my Savior and the wounds he bore for me I will sing of his salvation, bought with blood upon the tree. While the host of angels listen to a song they cannot sing, I will voice my praise to Jesus with the song of the redeemed. Of the redeemed, I stand redeemed by the blood of Jesus. The price is paid, my debt is gone, the chains that bound me no longer hold me because of Calvary I stand redeemed I stand redeemed by the blood of Jesus the price is paid, my debt is gone, the chains that bound me no longer hold me, because of Calvary I stand redeemed. Because of Calvary, I stand redeemed. Oh, man. 
What a song. Hi, honey. <laughs> what a song. My goodness. I want the recording. Praise the Lord. I stand redeemed. Aren't you glad to be saved? Huh? If you're not saved this morning, man, you can get saved this morning. Stand redeemed. Praise God. Well, again, I am so very happy to have the Vasics back with us. What a, what a superb couple. If you go online and, uh, and just research this couple, you're going to find that God is using them in such a magnificent way. They came out here to uh, warm up. It's been cold on the East Coast. And, uh, and, <laughs> and God has used them in such a powerful way. I, I've heard already wonderful things about the marriage retreat, and I'm just so thrilled about that. And, uh, and I'm glad that you all are here this morning. This preacher, last time he was here, when he preached, I'll tell you what, God really just got a hold of us in the messages that God used him to preach. And uh, I'll tell you something, I am so thankful to call this couple friends of Elmwood Baptist Church and of Gary and Betty Randall. So I want you to welcome Pastor Joe Vasick to the pulpit this morning. still see me okay? Yeah. All right. I've often wondered. You want me to set those off to the side, brother? Oh, yes, sir. Get the Thank you. Needle. I've often wondered, you know, I preach every sermon at home sitting down, and I have for several years, and uh, I hope I get to a place where I can stand again, but I've often wondered how it would go if I was, you know, and no offense if this is you, but if I was, you know, five foot four or something, because uh, <laughs> then nobody would see me, you know, but... <laughs> But uh, anyway, uh, if you are, I'm sorry, and, and I, uh, I'm just, I hope you're still my friend. But um, open your Bible to Daniel chapter 11, if you would, please, Daniel chapter 11. I am in awe of the spirit of your church, and I know your church isn't perfect, but not because I've seen any flaws but only because I know that we're all human. But from where I stand, I certainly can't see any imperfections. You know the old line, if you ever find the perfect church, don't join it, you'll ruin it. <laughs> but I really am in awe of being around all of you for the past three days. And, uh, you know, it's, it's as much fun as a retreat like that is. It's all, there's also some burdens involved moving in and out and, and uh, uh, keeping the schedule and all that. I mean, just, that's just part of any kind of a trip like that. And, uh, and yet everybody's spirit was just on top and the fellowship. The fellowship was just, just as good as, as uh, any other part. Uh, you know, the videos and the games were pretty awesome. And uh, we, saw a, we saw a video on uh, the marriage version of the HGTV show Fixer Upper. That was pretty cool. And uh, so I've requested the sequel. I want to see the marriage version of Love It or List It and see what that's about. But anyway. <laughs> um, and I'm in awe of, of the spirit of your pastor. Um, pastor and Mrs. Randall weren't able to be at the retreat, but you could feel their heart in every session. They were, you were there. And I'm not just saying that to, I, I don't, <laughs> life's too short to spend in flattery. You got to say what you mean, and I mean that. And uh, I, in fact, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say this. I'm going to ask Pastor Randall before I leave today, before he leaves today, if you would lay hands on me and ask the Lord to, to put the spirit that you have of love for your people uh, in me, because it's just, it's awesome, and I'm, I am in awe of it, and uh, you should you should pray for your pastor, pray for Mrs. Randall. Mrs. Randall, my wife and I have looked forward to meeting you. Uh, we, we have not met Mrs. Randall yet, and uh, we look forward to meeting you today, um, but uh, 
pray pray for your pastor and his wife and uh, you you know they're human you know they're not uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, you know what superhero but uh, pray for God to keep his hand upon them and bless them they are a special treasure Daniel chapter 11 let's read verses 31 through 35 Daniel 11 is one of the most difficult to understand prophetic chapters in the Bible. And uh, I have certainly not mastered it. I could give you an overview of what it's about, but there's certain details. In fact, there is a, a preacher in, in Florida who is a, uh, he's a pastor, but he's also, he's a Bible scholar. And uh, I follow him on YouTube. And while I'm eating breakfast at my desk uh, early Sunday morning, I, I listen to his videos and I've learned so much. So one day I saw that he had a video on uh, Daniel 11. And I'm going, oh, good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn about this chapter that is on my top five Bible chapters of not, not real sure everything that's going on there. And uh, I'm going to learn something today. So I put it on. And uh, first thing he says... He said, let me just tell you folks right up front. He said, there's some parts of this chapter where I have no idea what's going on. I go, okay, <laughs> all right. So I didn't feel so bad about myself here. But let's read the passage, and uh, then we'll jump into it. Verses 31 through 35, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity, and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fail, they shall be hoping with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time in this word this morning. Father, I beg you to move among us in spite of me. I thank you, Lord, for giving me the great privilege of being your servant. And you know my heart, this is not a, an expression of false humility, this is, this is my heart. That if the folks here knew, knew me better, uh, they would wonder if I was qualified to, to stand before them. And Lord, I, I am sorry for failing you so often. But I humbly ask you today, in light of the importance of this hour, there's not going to be another time like this all week for, for any of us. I pray, Lord, that you would use the person that this day at this time you've put behind this pulpit to be a help to all of us. Renew in me the, the wonder of the topic and help me to express to everyone here what this truth has meant to me over the years. Please, Lord, I pray that you'd bless it in a powerful way. Lord, I pray for folks who came today in spite of the fact that their pastor is not preaching. And I pray that you'd reward them for, for coming anyway. I know our folks a lot of times don't like to come when the pastor's not preaching. And folks did today, and I pray that you'd, you'd bless them for that. And I pray that it would not be me, but it would be your spirit using your word to open our eyes to some wonderful truths for thy glory. In Christ's name I pray, amen. There's an element of American history that is definitely overlooked by people that don't know the Lord, people that don't have a Christ-centered view of history, and it's largely ignored by Christian people. And that element is something in the late 1700s and the early, eight, actually throughout the 1800s, even into the 1900s, called camp meeting. Camp meetings began as in the late 1700s, 
People were moving west from the original 13 colonies. And as they did, they did not always move in settlements. They did not always establish towns immediately. And it was a long process. You know, a lot of people moving from more populated places were just trying to get out there a little bit, get away, get away somewhere and stake their claim. And in doing so, they separated themselves uh, to, to a large degree from the population. Because of this, churches were not immediately established. And churches were a huge part of the 13 colonies. And so they're moving to a place where there's no churches. Well, preachers caught hold of this. It was, it was mostly Methodist preachers, but the Baptists also got, got involved in this, and so did the, the uh, Presbyterians. But to go to a place, and if you couldn't establish a church there, have a big meeting where people within driving distance could come and be in church, be in a service, Every day of the week for a week, two weeks, three weeks, all different times, all different meetings. And these meetings were held annually. And they came to be called camp meetings. The Methodist circuit-riding preacher Francis Asbury wrote in his journal in 1811 that he knew of over 400, 1811, over 400 annual camp meetings from Georgia to Michigan. It was a huge part of our history. And they, that was 1811. It continued throughout the 1800s. And even in places where there were churches, it was a, an annual meeting. It became a, a revival meeting slash vacation, family vacation. They were very popular. You should study the history. In fact, if you, if you, have, if you know anything about the, the most, uh, one of the most elite vacation spots in America is Martha's Vineyard. Now go do your research on this. Martha's Vineyard began as a Christian camp meeting. The tabernacle still stands. And it was a, 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 an amazing part of our history. So, in 1857... A 25-year-old man named William Osborne went to a camp meeting. He was saved, and God called him to preach. And because he was saved in a camp meeting, now as a young preacher in his 20s, he had a burden for camp meeting. So he wasn't looking necessarily to be the speaker at a camp meeting, but to go to various camp meetings and just help. How, any, any way he could. So he started to travel and to try to help and be a blessing at camp meetings. That was, uh, he got saved in 1857. Twelve years later, in 1869, he was in a place about halfway between Philadelphia and New York City, right on the Atlantic Ocean, meeting with some other preachers in the month of July. July 30, 31st, 1869. And they met in this place where there was no town, there were no churches, there was no anything. They were out in the middle of nowhere along the shores of the Atlantic between Philadelphia and New York. And they met there and they prayed. And he persuaded these other preachers, and at this time he's 34 years old, 30, yeah, 30, I'm sorry, 37 years old, 36 years old. He's in his 30s. <laughs> and... Uh, he told these other preachers, he said, you see this beautiful spot. There's no town here. There's no church here. There's no camp meeting anywhere around here. Man, if you visited New Jersey today, the last thing you would think of would be barren land. It's, it's packed. But at that point, it was, it was just wide open space in that part of New Jersey. He said, what if we were to establish a camp meeting here? And so they voted on that very day. After prayer, they voted July 31st, 1869 to establish a camp meeting. But they did more than establish a camp meeting. They established a camp meeting destination. They divided, they, they got a, a, a permit to start a town. They divided that town into plots and they sold those plots. They dug wells. They built a town around the camp meeting. And they called it Ocean Grove. 
That was 1869. Here's how it grew. By 1877, there were over 700,000 train tickets sold from New York and from Philadelphia with Ocean Grove as their destination. In 1894, it had become so popular and they couldn't, they had built one tabernacle and it was, couldn't hold the crowd. So they tore it down and built a bigger one. That couldn't hold the crowds. In, in 1894, they built a 10,000 seat auditorium. And that auditorium still stands, if you want to check it out later, not now, a Google image search of the Ocean Grove, they call it the Great Auditorium. It's unbelievable. Billy Sunday preached there. Fanny Crosby, uh, I won't say performed, but you know, she sang there and played there. It was unbelievable, and it still stands to this day. I had the opportunity to visit it about uh, 15 years ago. In 1872, this, this, this Ocean Grove town was so phenomenally successful, and William Osborne could see that it was in good hands. And so he resigned as the head of this commission because he had a burden to go other places and do the same thing. Before he died, he established 30 other camp meetings. He established camp meetings in India. He established some in Australia. One of them is called a town called Ocean Grove, Australia, just like he had done in New Jersey. In 1902, he passed away. He was buried in Westchester County, which is where I grew up. He's buried about 30 minutes from where I live. On his grave marker is this verse, Daniel eleven thirty-two: 32. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Daniel 11 is a detailed prophecy with a short-term fulfillment and a long-term fulfillment. Many prophecies in the Old Testament. Many, of, many Old Testament passages have a current application, then a short-term fulfillment, and then a long-term fulfillment. Daniel 11 has a short-term fulfillment that applies to the period in between the Testaments. And it talks about a, a guy that uh, isn't named in the chapter, but in history, we, he would be revealed as his name was Antiochus Epiphanes. The long-term application has to do with the tribulation period and the Antichrist. So I'm not going to preach on that prophecy today. I'm going to lift this verse that was on William Osborne's tombstone and teach you a principle that you can find anywhere in the Bible. I could show you this principle in Philippians 3. I could show you, I say anywhere in the Bible, throughout the Bible, I could show you this principle in Colossians chapter 1. And that is found, it's wrapped up in these three words from Daniel 11.32. Know, be, and do. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Those three words, in that order, describe the believer's path to spiritual and eternal achievement. If you want to thrive, you need to know God, become what He makes you, and then do what He has for you to do. Pleasing God with your life is a matter of knowing God. Becoming what He wants you to be. And doing what He has for you to do. All of your success in your Christian life depends upon your passion to know God. It all begins with knowing God. Man, how many tragedies have we seen? People we've known, people we've heard about because they were so wrapped up in doing but they skipped knowing God. And I don't mean being saved. I mean a passionate pursuit of of God. 1983, I was 16 years old. I was a sophomore in a ACE school in uh, Hudson Valley, New York State, just north of New York City, where I live right now. And little, it was a one-room schoolhouse, K through 12, in a room that's about a quarter the size of your auditorium. 
And we would go to convention. I, y'all have an AC school here, don't you? Now, I don't know if they still have conventions, but every year they would have state convention, and then the winners from all 50 states and all kinds of categories would go to nationals. Well, I got to go to nationals in eighth grade. Uh, then in ninth grade, it was in Arizona, and our principal didn't want to fool with Arizona, so we didn't go. Um, but then in 10th grade, I got to go again. This time it was in Texas, at, at uh, North Texas State University in Denton, Texas. Christian school students from mostly the United States, but all over the world were there. There were five or 6,000 Christian school students there. And the feature, the highlight of every day of the week was in the evening, they'd have a preaching service. And they'd, they'd have men of God from all over America preach those services. I heard Dr. Lee Robertson preach there. I heard, I heard uh, Dr. Jack Hiles preach there. Dr. 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 Curtis Hudson preach there. Tremendous, tremendous services. Usually those were inside of like the basketball arena. But this one night, for some reason, this Tuesday night in uh, June of 1983, I was 16 years old, it was on the football field of the, of the college there. And so we're sitting around, and anyway, our seats were pretty high up there. And we're looking down, you could barely see the guy on the stage, but he preached that night in the subject from Philippians 3.10, that I may know him. Now, I had grown up in a Christian home, I had grown up in church, and now I was in a Christian school. My whole life was Christianity. I got saved, I made a profession when I was five, I made another profession when I was seven, but I think I got nailed it down when I was 14. I had won people to Christ. I was called to preach when I was seven. I preached my first full-length sermon when I was 12. I knew the, the deal, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I knew it, the, the whole church thing. But I'm sitting there as a 16-year-old hearing this preacher preach on that I may know him. And all of a sudden I realized he's describing something I don't have. And as I'm listening talk about his pursuit of knowing God and talking about the Apostle Paul, and he made this statement to most of you, unfortunately, Superman is more real than Jesus is. He said to most of you, Bugs Bunny is more real than Jesus is. You'd be more shocked to find out that Superman isn't real than if you, somebody persuaded you that Jesus isn't real. Oh, wow. And I found myself as he's preaching, wanting what he was describing. I didn't know what it meant. I, I sat in my seat and I thought, knowing God, I know, I know I'm saved. I know all kinds of Bible verses. I know, I even know how to preach a little bit. I know how to win a soul to Christ. But knowing God, how can you know a God you can't see? He was talking about knowing Him like you know your best friend. How can you know a God that you can't hear His voice with your ears, that you can't touch Him? How can you say that you know Him? But when He gave the invitation, as far away as I was, and ultimately the, the altar was filled down there on the football field, but somehow... I was the first one down there. I remember kneeling on the ground in front of the pulpit. And I glanced up at the preacher. And I glanced over at the founder of ACE. In fact, I think I still somewhere have a picture. I, I, at the altar, I snapped a picture of them right there. But then I bowed my head and I said, Lord, I don't get it. I don't know what it means to know you. But if the Apostle Paul knew you without meeting you, without seeing you, touching you, and if that man says he knows you, then that's what I want. In fact, Lord, if that's all I get out of the rest of my life, that's what I want to live for. I don't need anything else if I could know you. And can I tell you, Nearly 40 years later, I know what it means. I know the Lord. I, I don't know Him as well as I want to. I'm going to get to know Him more today than I did yesterday. 
But I know now what I didn't understand as, as a 16-year-old. I know what it means to know the Lord. And by His grace, and listen, my heart gets cold, and my heart gets filled with apathy, and I've got to fight all the things that you've got to fight. But by the grace of God, I do fight them. Because I want to be driven by the passion to know the Lord. The people that do know their God. Who, who's going to... Who's going to make it in this crazy period that we're in, in in history? I'll tell you who's going to make it. The people that do know their God. I've been telling my people over and over and over again, I don't know what lies ahead. It could be the ruin of our country. Sure seems like that's what we're watching. It could be, by the grace of God, a sweeping revival. Oh God, may it be so. It could be the rapture in the very near future. I think those are the only three options, by the way. If you're looking for America to go back to being like Mayberry again, I don't think that's in our future, no matter what happens. But here's what I've told our folks again and again and again. Whichever one of those three it is, or maybe a fourth that, that I can't even comprehend, whatever it is, the people who are going to be prepared for it are going to be the people that do know their God. And let me urge you, wherever you're at in your walk, wherever you're at in, in your relationship with God, plead with God to have a passion to know Him. If you don't know Jesus Christ today, meaning you're not saved, please don't walk out those doors without making Jesus your Savior. It's a, it's, you don't, you're not joining the church. It's not uh, promising to give money or anything like that. It's a choice of faith. By grace, God's grace, are ye saved through your faith. It's God's grace and your faith. Your faith that puts God's grace to work to save your soul. And you can make that choice today. Don't leave here if, if, you, if you haven't done that. If you have made Jesus your Savior... Would you decide today to pursue knowing the Lord? You say, I, yeah, but I don't, I don't know what that means. I know that you don't know. I've been where you are. Then go to a quiet place. Go to a peaceful place. Walk in the field. Walk, walk in the woods somewhere. Say, God, I don't know what I'm asking really except I want to know you. I want to know. You know the problem with most of us as believers is we, we want to know God, but we want a lot of other things too. Do you want to know God so much that you're willing to let go of whatever else conflicts with it? All of your success in your Christian life depends upon your passion to know God. Truly knowing God no, be good. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Truly knowing God will inevitably lead you to being what God wants you to be. And being what God wants you to be will lead you to doing what God wants you to do. He will take you to the battles that you need to fight. And he will give you, he will make you what you need to be to win them. He will walk you through it. But not if he has no place in your life. Not if he's distant. Not if he's your third or fourth or fifth priority. He's got to be your passion. In the country of Hungary in the early 1900s, in a small village that was a Catholic village. There was a, a couple that lived in poverty, as most of the people in that village did. And uh, the husband was a drunk. And they went to the little Catholic chapel in town. But a, I said little Catholic chapel, to the Catholic chapel, I don't know how big that was, but the, there was a little Baptist church in town. And the wife had gone to the Baptist church and she had gotten saved. 
And her eyes were opened. And she immediately had a passion for the Lord. Well, her husband wasn't happy about it. And he basically told her, hey, you just keep your Christianity to yourself. Don't bother me with it. Don't ask me to go to your church. I'm a Catholic. Now, I'm not a Catholic basher. But I do understand the difference. And I do understand the harm of the doctrine. And man, I certainly do understand the history and the, the havoc that they have wreaked in this world. He said, you just go to your little church. And he said, don't bother me with it. So that's the way they were living. The wife was expecting a baby. And one day while she was expecting, a knock came on the door. And the husband went to the door and opened it up. And the Catholic priest was standing there. And he said, Father... What, what can we do for you? And he said, I understand that there's a Bible in this home. And he said, unless you bring it to me immediately, this whole household is going to hell. And so the husband said, uh, I'll look into it. He closed the door. He walked into the next room, found his wife. He said, woman, I want that Bible of yours. And she said, no. Well, he didn't know where it was. She kept it hidden. He said, woman, you find that Bible? Bring it to me. I'm giving it to the Father. And she said, you can't have my Bible. Amen. He said, I'm going to take care of you. He walked back to the front door and opened the door and said, I, I believe you're mistaken, Father. There's no Bible in our house. The priest left. He closed the door and the man went back and beat his wife bloody. And she lost the baby. But she kept her Bible. And we can't understand that because we've got 20 or 30 of them in our houses. But that was a precious treasure to her. Would you believe it? It was just a couple of years later. That the same exact thing happened. I mean, every detail happened again. The priest came to the door. The husband went and found his wife and threatened her. And she would not get her Bible out. And the husband sent the priest away. And she was expecting again. And he beat his wife again. And she lost the baby again for her Bible. Finally, the day came, they were expecting a baby again, and they had a son. Son got to be in his early 20s, and he said, I'm going to go to America. Well, of course, in those days, we're talking about the, still the earlier part of the 1900s. In those days, a trip to America was usually a one-way trip. You were saying goodbye forever. And as it turned out, he was saying goodbye to his parents forever. As he was saying goodbye to his mom, and she had told him the story Many times, she handed him her Bible. She said, take this to America with you, and don't ever forget what it cost me. She took, he took the Bible to America. He hadn't been saved yet. But he wound up getting saved, met a Hungarian Christian girl. They got married. They had one son. That son grew up, got saved. God called him to preach. God made him a pastor in Belleville, Michigan, just outside of Detroit. That church has brought tens of thousands of people to Jesus Christ. It's a good-sized church. If, you ever, if you're ever coming out of the Detroit airport headed west on I-90, I-90 or 94, 94, I, I'm 94, you can't miss it on your right-hand side, this big, beautiful brick church, pastored by the grandson of that woman who refused to give up her Bible. His last name is Vaporzan. It's a pretty unique name. Right now, there are five men in America with the last name of Vaporzan, and all five of them are Baptist preachers. All five of them 
or her grandchildren or great-grandchildren. The people that do know their God shall be strong. That woman was strong. And there'll be thousands of people in heaven because that woman was strong. Why was she strong? Because she knew God. And through her, the Lord did exploits. The people that do know God shall be strong and shall do exploits. Here's the thing. You need to protect that part of your day where you get to know God. Now, knowing God is an all-day thing, but in my opinion, I know folks say, and, and maybe, maybe Pastor Randall says this, doesn't matter when you read your Bible and pray, and that is true. But for my own self, I don't see any way I'd make it through the day without meeting with the Lord in the morning. Maybe somebody here starts work at 3 in the morning, you say, please, <laughs> you're kidding. Okay, and I know you have to do what works for you. But my opinion is you got to get with God as early in the day as you possibly can. I, I, for me, I know I do. I have to. And once you find those times in the day where you get with God, where you don't just read your Bible and check off some boxes, but seek the Lord. Let His Word fill your heart. Memorize Scripture so that it can flow through. I love to memorize Scripture by the chapter. You, you want to start, you, you want to know, you say, I couldn't do that. I'll tell you where to start. Psalm 117. Psalm 117, hey, get this. First of all, it's prophetic. It's quoted in Romans 15. Not only that, it's the shortest chapter in the Bible, two verses. And something else about Psalm 117 that I just discovered a few, few weeks ago. I was thinking, okay, there's 1,189 chapters in the Bible. So that means odd number, that means there's a middle chapter. If it was even, there'd be two equal parts. I know it's Sunday, we don't do math on Sunday, but <laughs> because it's an odd number, that means there's a middle chapter. What is that middle chapter? You know what I discovered it was? Psalm 117. You want to start somewhere? Memorize Psalm 117. That way, when you need to bring your mind back to the Lord, you don't have to just think about, I, I believe in memorizing individual verses, but if you memorize by the chapter, man, you can, just, you can just be in meditation with the Lord all the time. I am no walking Bible. I know people who've memorized the New Testament. I haven't done anything close to that. But there's four or five chapters that I've committed to memory that they are my precious friends. I can walk with the Lord in John chapter 1 or the first half of Hebrews 11, or the first 40 verses of Psalm 119, or Proverbs chapter 1, anytime I choose. When I was a teenager, my go-to chapter when I was facing temptation, and still is, but it started when I was a teenager, is Romans 6. When a thought came into my mind that I needed to get out immediately, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Listen, what I'm talking about is transferring from an academic Christianity to a Christ-centered, a Christianity that is passionate for Christ. And that's the life you're going to love. And that's the life that's going to make you strong. And that's the life that's going to make you do exploits. Way too many Christians jump to the doing. And they skip over the knowing. When you skip the knowing, the, the being really gets hindered. And the doing is empty and shallow. And ultimately, the doing, you self-destruct when you try to do without knowing God. I hope I'm not wearing you out with the stories, but i got to tell you one more. I had heard this for the first time about 10 years ago, and I said, I can't believe I've never heard of this man. 1650 in Scotland. A man named Henry Scougal was born. His father was a preacher. And so he, growing up in a Christian home and in church, his life was all about God. But he didn't reject it. He embraced it. He went away to the university at a very young age, still as a, uh, in the middle of his teens, graduated from the university while he was still in his teens. Henry Scougal was, was a scholar. He learned 
several different languages to study the Word of God better. When he graduated, he went away, I think it was called King's College in, in Scotland, but he left King's College and went uh, to become a pastor about an hour away. He pastored there for a year before his alma mater contacted him and said, we'd like you to come back and lead our divinity department. He said, sure. So he went back and spent the rest of his 20s, the rest of his life, leading the divinity department of the college that he graduated from. I say the rest of his life because when he was about 28 years old, he got tuberculosis and he died. Tragic life, right? He loved the Lord. He was passionate about the Lord and His Word. But he died when he was 28 or 29 years old. What a tragedy. One thing he did while he was alive is he had a friend who had grown up around Christianity, but he had this outlook on the Christian life that it was just about rules. It was just about putting on a show at church. It was just about meeting up with everybody's approval. It was phony and plastic. And Henry Skugel got a burden for his friend. He said, I want to convince him otherwise. So he sat down to write him a letter. He wrote him a letter. Listen to some of the statements he wrote in this letter. These are direct quotes from his letter. True religion is a union of the soul with God. Who wouldn't want that? But this is the way he saw his relationship with God. True religion is a union of the soul with God, a real participation of the divine nature. The very image of God drawn upon the soul. I want that. It is Christ formed within us. I know not how it can be more fully expressed than by calling it a divine life. He said, the love which a pious man bears to God and goodness is not so much by virtue of a command enjoining him to do so as by a new nature instructing him and prompting, prompting him to do it. It is a real participation of God's nature. It is a beam of the eternal light. A drop of that infinite ocean of goodness. And they who are endowed with it may be said to have God dwelling in their souls and Christ formed within them. When we have said all that we can, the secret mysteries of a new nature and divine life can never be sufficiently expressed. Language and words cannot reach them, nor can they be truly understood by those souls that are enkindled within and awakened under the sense and relish of spiritual things. All that the holy life of the blessed Jesus may be always in my thoughts and before mine eyes till I receive a deep sense and impression of those excellent graces that shine so eminently in Him. And let me never cease my endeavors till that new and divine nature prevail in my soul and Christ be formed within me. I, in all my research, have not been able to find whether or not his friend got saved. But what I do know is that after Henry Skugel's tragically young death, they took that letter and they published it. And when they published it, it was over 50 pages long. Now, you know how the difference between when you print something versus when you hand... So how long must that handwritten letter have been? Over 50 pages long. They published it and they called it The Life of God and the Soul of Man. That's not the end of the story. 50 years later, a young man named George Whitfield was in college in England. And he was trying to work his way to salvation. He was trying to outpray everybody. He was trying to outwork everybody. He was trying to uh, uh, memorize and learn more scripture, but, but not, for, not for the purpose of outdoing everybody and working his way to salvation. Suffering, fasting. And he was getting so frustrated. And this is in his own autobiography. Somehow a copy of the life of God in the soul of man published 50 years before 
got into his hands and he opened it up and he said, I read, true religion is a union of the soul with God, a real participation of the divine nature, the very image of God drawn upon the soul. And George Whitfield, it took his breath away. He put the book down and he realized, whoever this guy is, he's got something I don't have, but I want it. And he realized he either have to, had to keep doing what he was doing, trying to work his way to God, and throw this book in the fire, or he had to keep reading and walk away from that lifestyle. He decided to keep reading. And he wrote in his autobiography, it's a result of the testimony of Henry Scougal, that I got saved. Well, you know what George Whitfield did. George Whitfield came to America as an evangelist and he brought multitudes to Christ in all of the 13 original colonies. George Whitfield is one of, and some would say, the spiritual founding father of America. And I think some of that has to go. Some of that credit has to go to Henry Scougal, a man who didn't preach great campaigns, a man who didn't build a massive church, a man who was not widely known, but he knew God. And it changed who he was, and he decided to write a letter to his friend, and in writing a letter to his friend, he impacted every single one of us. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Would you bow your heads, please? God, I pray that you would increase my passion for you. Don't ever let me be content. Oh, God, please, please change me. Please make me like Christ. Please cause me to go passionately after you. Don't ever let it be a show. Oh, God, I pray that it would be real. I pray for everyone here, every believer here, that we would go more passionately after you than we ever have before. And I pray, Lord, if there's someone here today that does not know Jesus Christ, just like Henry Scougal's friend has, has resisted for whatever reason, oh, God, may they decide by faith in Jesus Christ today to have the life of God in their soul, the salvation purchased at Calvary. Please, God, I pray, work among us. In Christ's name I pray. If you... Let's stand together. If the Lord worked in your heart today, the altar's open. Would you talk to the Lord about it? Would you talk to the Lord about it? If you are here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've never been saved, you can't know Him until you come by way of the cross. Jesus died for you. He's the Son of God. He came to earth to die for our sins, to die in our place. And that's what the cross is all about. He died for your sins. He paid the penalty for your sins. He was buried. He rose again. He not only, so not only did He pay for sin, but He conquered death. God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ died in your place. but you must receive him for yourself. He makes an invitation to you. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Have you believed on Jesus? If you have not believed on Jesus, I beg you, take him as your Savior today. Come, You can walk down to the front and one of, uh, one of these men right here will take the Bible. If you're a lady, a lady will take the Bible and show you from the Bible how to be sure that you're on your way to heaven. Don't leave here without doing that if you don't know Jesus Christ. If you're at the altar, please take your time before the Lord.
one of the most powerful sermons I've heard in many, many years. If we let this sink in, if our heart becomes hungry and thirsty for God, God's waiting for us. God's right where God's always been. The question is, where are we? We go through the motions. We know the lingo. We know what's expected. But do we know God? Do we know God? I think it's very clear this morning that to know God means that we obey God. To be yielded is to be surrendered, to be submissive. That's what, that's what it means to walk in the Spirit. What a powerful message this morning, Brother Vasek. God used you, my brother. We're just vessels. We want to be used of God, but we have to know Him. We have to know Him. Father in heaven, I thank you for the words of Scripture this morning. Powerful. We can't be strong and we can't do great exploits if we don't know you. And, and Lord, these people, these people in the revolt that, that took place because they knew you and they stood for you just like this lady who would not give up her Bible, no matter the cost, no matter what it cost her, I'm not giving up the Word of God. And these people, many of which sacrificed their lives to stand for what was right. Why? Because they knew you. And so, Lord, here's our generation now. And Lord, will we be strong? We see our nation is crumbling around us. The world is on fire. Are we going to be strong? Are we going to do great exploits? Or are we going to cower? God, help us to know you. Help us to hunger and thirst to know you. Please help us. In Jesus' name I ask these things. Amen. I'm so glad you're here this morning. Are you glad to be here? Yeah. We're going to have a great time of fellowship. I don't want you to leave. I want you to stay. I want you to stay and visit. I want you to spend a couple minutes with somebody that you don't even know in your own church. Let's have fellowship. And let's enjoy it. Amen? God bless you. You're dis Well, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We must pray for the food. <laughs> Amen? Father, thank you for the banquet that we're about to enjoy. Thank you for the hands that have prepared all this food. Bless those who are next door that have 
labored as servants to us so that we can enjoy this time. Bless it all for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you're dismissed. And don't forget the main, the main lesson here. Guess